Hi, I'm David Blakey. I work at Google. I've spent a couple of years working on debug info on LLVM. And the last six months wreaking havoc on everyone who has an out of tree anything. Uh, opaque pointer types. If anyone's seen it in the commit lists, it usually accompanies a bunch of churn for pretty much everything. Uh, but we'll talk about why we're doing it, how we're doing it, and how it might look in the end. Let's have a look. Right, why are we doing it? About a year ago, this is where it came to my attention at least, Chandler committed a couple of patches uh, relating to canonicalization. So we used to canonicalize a store and a load based on the type that the pointer you were loading or storing to was, and then casting the value back and forth. This produced less good outcomes, it wasn't the best canonicalization, so we switched to the opposite. We cast the pointer and then store it or load it using the natural value type. Great, that made things better. But obviously it's not the only one of these sort of bugs. Um, and we would like to you know, reduce the number of these sort of issues that come up. So we have loads of code in LLVM that deals with these sort of issues. But at some point we have to move on from that and hopefully fix them all by changing the representation. So to talk a little more about the representational problem, LLVM AI was modeled very much off C. Pointer types are kind of a guideline. You could write the code like this in function f, and this is totally correct C, as long as you do some other stuff. But in LLVM AI, it's totally correct. We will not do anything wrong with this code. Um, so the pointer types didn't really give us a lot from an IR perspective. They just get in the way of optimizations. They are at best a benign lie and at worst a misleading problem. So what can we do if we remove them? So if we imagine like taking C code and instead of having int pointer and char pointer and float pointer, we just had void pointer. It's all we've got. That removes the lie, makes our lives a little more difficult, but it also makes it better. So some of the things that might happen if we did this is we could remove 150 places that use one of the most simple primitives to get around this problem, which is remove pointer casts, strip pointer casts, sorry. Uh, those are the easy ones to find. Obviously the ones that channel was changing, they don't show up in a simple grep. There are loads of pieces of code that look through bit casts and do other transformations to try to work around this representational problem. So we'd like to get rid of all of those, but there's also some practical benefits. We have those 150 calls and a bunch of other stuff. But we added all that stuff when we found bugs, right? Like we, we found that the canonicalization was a problem, so we worked around it. If it's already canonical, we don't have to work around it, and thus all of the other places we haven't found yet should just fall out. So we should get a bunch of runtime improvements from optimizations that no longer are failing to work around this problem, because the problem won't exist. And we should get potentially some compile time improvements because we will have less extra IR that isn't actually telling us anything useful. It's just getting in our way. So how do we do this? There's a huge change to LLVM IR. Um, same way we do any other commits, ideally. Small pieces, really small pieces. Some of those small pieces are also huge because we have to change the textual representation, the bitcode representation, if you've noticed, the textual representation is used in all of the 20,000 test cases we have. We'll get to that. So that's sort of where I started. I started at the most obvious place that I could think of. Where does this totally fall down? Well, it totally falls down at the most simple instructions. Things like load and gep. Load and gep use the type that the pointer points to of their pointer operand, and they, they do what they say on the tin. Well, you're not gonna have that information anymore. So how does load and gap actually work? Uh, as you can see in these exam examples here, we have to transform, we have to provide explicit type information as well as the opaque pointer that we'll now have. If you saw the commits that happened earlier this year, this happened. Well, half of this happened. It actually looks kind of silly at the moment if you've ever noticed because it's load i32 comma i32 star. So it's sort of redundant. But we're putting all the pieces in place so that we can eventually move towards this kind of future. As I mentioned, updating test cases. You also might have noticed these commits included thousands of changes to tests because the text changed. These commits also included a bunch of Python code and shell scripts. 
So if you have your out of tree tests, you can take that Python code and shell scripts and you can run it over your tests, even those with check lines. So Clang obviously doesn't have checked in IR, but it has a bunch of IR embedded in checks because it wants to check that it generates the right IR. Most of the transformations that I provided will update your check code pretty reliably. I think even in the worst case, I only had to manually update maybe 10 tests and possibly change about five out of tens of thousands uh, so that they would work with the, the checker. And this is the simplest of the regexes I used. <laughs> uh, so after I started with the easy things, I started to find a little bit of a habit. I decided to focus on all of the IR changes I might need. I did that by uh, essentially asserting that the pointer type was never, the pointer element type was never accessed, and then running a simple script that would serialize and deserialize every LLVM IR test case. So that tests IR writing, IR reading, bit code writing, and bit code reading. Once I had that as a principle that I was driving towards, I found the next sets of things that I needed to transform. So bitcode had the same problem as textual IR, has the advantage it doesn't have a lot of migration to do, disadvantage that backwards compatibility is still necessary. Interestingly, the store instruction, which I wasn't expecting to have to touch, had a bitcode dependence on this because it stored the type once. Uh, bitcode deserialization, much like textual IR, is a little weird has the type at the usage point, and it uses that as part of the deserialization mechanism. So the store would store the pointer type, but it would use the value from that pointer type to figure out how to read its value parameter, the, the actual i32, for example, that you might be storing. It was strange. Call and invoke. Obviously, these take pointer parameters, but they kind of have their type information already embedded. They, they say their return type and their parameters, and that's great except for variadic calls. Variadic calls, because their type is not the type of their parameter list, have an explicit type on them. Notice this is a function pointer type, not a function type. Well, pointer types won't have type information. So obviously, we want to change that. Oh, did anyone see the wrinkle? If we use an explicit function pointer type to represent a function type for the call, what happens if we have a call that returns a function pointer type? Well, we have an explicit case for that, and we serialize, we serialize in the text the function type, including the function pointer type return type, to get around that little problem. So this craziness happens. Uh, we can avoid that. What if we just use the function type? Then we fix my problem, and we fix this oddity. And so we did. So here are your three examples, your variadic function call, which has to be explicit because we needed to express that extra information, your function returning a function pointer type, totally as it would, and your function re returning void. A Bunch of other stuff. So as I went through all of this, gap operators and other fun things, global aliases were the last one I fixed, and that's brought us to nearly done for serializing and deserializing, except for a couple of wrinkles. This one, I have a thread going that I need to resurrect at some point. Bival. You know, you have a... Maybe this doesn't make sense. I think I'm missing an asterisk in that example there. Uh, so Bival is on a pointer parameter type, and it just says to LLVM, you need to copy all the bytes of this struct in the function call somehow. So again, we'll lose the pointer element type, and so we won't know what to copy. How many bytes do we need to copy? We could represent it in a couple of different ways. We haven't really decided which one. We could have bival take a number of bytes. We could have bival take the type, just move the type from one place to another. The type kind of looks more natural. It's what we've been used to dealing with. The number of bytes is the practical reality of what this represents. Um, it's not clear what the right solution is. I kind of like the number of bytes because it's easy to implement. Attributes already support integer parameters. They don't support type parameters but I do not look forward to trying to do the transformation to update all the test cases for that. Because I'm gonna not be able to do that with any kind of regex, because there's nothing that tells me how many bytes that struct represents. Like, I can't just move it from somewhere to somewhere else. 
this is a harder wrinkle to explain. So, again, LLVMIR uses all of this type information during its serialization and deserialization, both for bit code and for the textual representation. So whenever you reference any value, you have the type information and you do a type-based name lookup of sorts. Just curious. So if you reference a global variable, there's different syntax. You know it's a global because it has the at symbol. But you don't know what it is. You don't know whether it's a global variable or a function or an alias. Well, because you have the type information, you were smart. And you looked at it and said, well, this is appointed to an int. It must be a global variable. So you create a stub global variable with the right name because you have the name. And then later on, you see the definition or the declaration of the variable. And you're like, OK, I'll just fill in the rest of the data on that global variable that I already created. This isn't going to work with an untyped pointer, because we're not going to know what we're looking for. But what about aliases? How do aliases work? Well, they don't, <laughs> kind of. We create a global variable, because we don't know any better. And then later on, we find an alias, and we just replace all uses with. Rather than filling in extra stuff, we actually had created the wrong thing. So we create a global alias, we replace the global variable, and we kill the global variable. Could we do something similar for functions and variables? Kind of, but not quite. I tried to do this. This took a little bit of work. Uh, but the types don't match, of course, which is the extra wrinkle. For global aliases and variables, the types match perfectly. When the types don't match, we could bit cast. So we could sort of create, say, a global variable all the time that's just of type int. Doesn't really matter. And bit cast that to the right type and then call it uh, or use it however it should be used. But then things like the constant folder, like remove my bit casts, and I don't really know what I need to RAUW anymore. There were some ideas I think Richard Smith suggested that I could, rather than trying to RAUW the bit casted value, I could bit cast the new value and RAUW the original. So there'd be like extra bit casts in there that would all hopefully get folded away, because that was what was getting in my way anyway. It's not clear whether either of those solutions are really useful as an intermediate step. We may just leave that as one of the things we have to deal with in the final step, where we actually remove pointer types. Because once we remove pointer element types, well, now global variables and global functions actually have the same type. They're just opaque pointers. So we can just do the same thing we did for global aliases, RAUW the whole thing, move on. No type mismatching, no extra bit casts. It's kind of a bootstrapping problem. As I was doing this, I did my best to actually migrate as many APIs as I could. Uh, so actually adding in global type information to different data structures that needed it uh, to avoid having to rely on the, the element types. Mostly these were backwards compatible, so I just added an overload that takes an explicit type. You can keep using the old one for now. One of them I tried to actually force all, up, all APIs to be updated, but with a, backwards compatibility, a different backwards compatibility step of being able to pass null for the explicit type. I think this was a mistake. It didn't really help, and it still means that I have to revisit all of those callers that have passed null and make them pass something else later anyway, and they'll be harder to find. At least when I had a syntactic change, I could just find them by compilation errors. Now I have to find them by like runtime errors and things like that, assert that it's not null. So what happens next? We're far from done, unfortunately. As much as serialization and deserialization is a key part of everything, it's not the end of the story. Optimizations are probably my next step. So going through LLVM's test suite and actually running the tests. So this will allow us to simplify optimizations that already rely on this information. As we mentioned, there's a whole bunch of ways that we, we work around this information. And to fix optimizations that, that were depending on it in bad ways. So those will be a little tricky. They'll be smaller patches, but more involved, more semantic changes. Hopefully, they'll come out OK. Front ends, more involved, less interesting. It's very easy for a front end in its IR generation to create values and pass them around through its IR generation and expect to be able to get and load those directly. Won't be able to do that anymore. It'll need to keep type information along with those values or recompute that type information later on. We'll see how it goes. If you are migrating your code, and it would be great if you got a head start on this, or if you helped me, because I've got lots of code to migrate, uh, you can do essentially the same thing I did. Put an assertion in your code, run your tests, find out where it breaks, 
and try to fix it. How do you fix it? Uh, let's have a look at some examples. So this is like some of the cleanup that I did. And it's, it's really simple. It looks kind of obvious. You'll notice that you'll have to discover some APIs perhaps you didn't realize existed because they haven't existed until the last few months. Um, a global value. Mostly you would get the real type of a global variable or a function by asking for the type of the value, which is really a pointer type, and then getting the element type from there. Doesn't work. So there's actually a way to get that type directly. You get value type in this example. Uh, the first example is actually from the core code that does LTO linking. So you're mapping from one set of types in one module to another set of types in another module. It usually would map the pointer type across and then get the element type from that because that would map all of the, the subtypes. Doesn't work anymore. Type information isn't there. So just map the actual value type across and you'll notice that we didn't have to actually map the pointer address space because that actually is just one-to-one -one directly. What to expect? So we're gonna keep doing this for a while. Um, some churn, Bival will be updating a bunch of test cases. As I say, that one might be painful because size information is not easy to just move around. It's not there. We'll see. Then we're gonna have the less mechanical, more risky changes for the optimizations. Uninteresting changes to a front end that will just be a bunch of work. Hopefully we'll then introduce the new pointer type, perhaps substituting it out. So like keeping pointer type as the new name and making like retro pointer type as the old one so that we can keep it for uh, parsing old bit code and things like that. A big flag flip where we actually change everything along with anything that I couldn't actually do separately. As I say, things like the weird um, forward declaration stuff in the bit code. I'll probably have another go at those. I'll keep a list as I'm going of like, here are things I haven't managed to do separately and I'll try them all one more time and then I'll put everything that has to go in one big go in one big go. And then a bunch of cleanup. Some of the cleanup will be obvious. There'll be APIs that are just literally dead. We'll remove them and then remove all their callers. Some of it will be not obvious. It'll be working around uh, canonicalization issues. For example, merge func, which takes two similar functions or functions that do the same thing and makes one function. That works even when the pointer types are different in the parameters. So when it merges those two functions, it replaces one of them potentially with bit casts of the function and just calls it, even though the pointer parameter types don't match. Uh, so merge func deals with these functions that aren't function types, they're bit casts of functions. Um, with this change, that oh God, those bit casts will hopefully not be necessary, but it might take a while before we realize or we like re-examine that code and realize, oh, okay, now I can go in and simplify or make more precise type information in these uh, transformations. Um, so I imagine there'll be some lingering things several years from now. We'll go and look at code and go, that's overly like generic or weird or seems to be accepting things that it doesn't need to accept. And we can remove those things, but it'll be hard to identify them all like upfront. Mm. And I think that's about the end of it. I know I've rushed this a little bit and I realize this is sort of a large impact to a lot of developers, both in tree and out of tree. So we probably have some questions to ask of any kind. Open the field. There's one on the left here at least. Yes, there is a standing microphone on stage left, your right, and there's a walking microphone here. Hi, uh, thanks for working on this. Um, sure. So at the end of all of it in aggregate, when you look at all of the commits that have been going on in this area, do you expect the, the final line count to be negative? Yes, I think this should reduce the amount of code. Most of the, like, there is a bunch of code that works around the presence of bit casts and tries to canonicalize things or tries to ignore the complexities of canonicalization. Code should become simpler, so far as I understand. John. Why do global declarations need types? <laughs> That's a good question, and for a while I was hoping they didn't. Um, I tried to push that through, and I think I got down to some piece of 
ASM generation, which generated different assembly for a global declaration. I would have to go and look more closely. I there know that there are defaulting rules for alignments that we based on the LVM IR type, but like, I can't quite hear you because I know that we do do defaulting based on um, alignments. Uh, so we'll we'll use the alignment of the IR type that it has of the the value type even for a global declaration. But that's fairly straightforward for front ends to just. Generate. It was something more than that, and. Uh, this is going to sound weird because this is vague recollection from months ago. I swear there was some assembly that was like uppercase if it was a variable and lowercase if it was a f uh, function or the other way around, like in one of the assembly syntaxes. Well, that's but, okay, so but presumably IR is still going to distinguish between global variables and functions. Okay, then maybe I misunderstood the question. Run it by me again. Why do global declarations, um, like if, it, if it's not a definition, Right. If it's a definition, then we it can you know have a value type that is equal to its initialization type or the type of its initializer. Right. That you know constant initializers will still have value types. Right. Yeah. But if it's a declaration, like why does it have to carry a type at all? Is that a useful concept? That's a good question. I actually do not know offhand. I think I found something, but it may have only been for definitions. Okay. Um, so it's possible that declarations don't need type information. I don't know what that world looks like in terms of declarations versus definitions, because we have the same type that represents them, right. global variable, right. just has a flag saying whether it's a declaration or not. So I don't know what that world looks like, but okay. it's fair. So I'm kind of curious, you kind of glossed over the optimization problem. Uh, how many optimizations do we have that depend upon type information? And do you think there's a chance that someone might end up having to write, write a uh, infer types of all the pointers pass and attach that as metadata or something to drive some of those optimizations? I haven't got into the optimizations yet. Um, the one that I'm perhaps most afraid of is uh, SROA, sc scale replacement of aggregates, which needs to like deal with all of these things being pointed to and split them up. Um, We'll see how it goes. I, I think mostly things are going to get simpler though. Again, merge func being an, a nice obvious example. Merge func merges these two functions that, are, that have the same instructions. They just happen to be that one was declared with a float pointer parameter, one was declared with an int pointer parameter. It's just totally unhelpful. Doesn't improve things at all. Doesn't help the optimization. The optimization can't, like, is clearly not leaning on that at the moment. It's got extra code to compensate for it and bit cast function types. I don't know if that answers your question. I think the, the key thing here is that that's not really, the, it's not really semantic in LVMIR right now. Right, because but you can cast back and forth between them all, there's all of this code already working around it. So it's unlikely that any optimizations can depend too strongly on the types anyway, because you can't trust them. If they are, that's a problem for the optimization and probably a missed optimization opportunity, which is kind of the point. As we work through all of these issues, we will end up revealing those cases and, and shining a light on them and hopefully fixing them along the way because they won't be able to do it anymore. So all of, all of this uh, bit code and textual IR churn uh, leads me to ask you uh, what is your backward compatibility testing story? Uh, so IR, textual IR has no backward compatibility guarantee at all. Uh, and that's the heavy one, and I have migration tools for that in every commit. There are massive tools to help you upgrade your test suite. Bitcode does have a backwards compatibility guarantee. We have Bitcode backwards compatibility test cases. I've checked them in whenever I've changed the Bitcode representation. I've added a targeted test case for it, which tests the, the error both testing the error paths for the new intermediate bit code. So I have extra errors to make sure that in this intermediate state we actually match up the extra type information that we're now passing and to test the original bit code still parses. Pretty sure I'm still testing that. So it's just explicit testing the same way we do for any other piece of LLVM. So, so a pile of new bit code test input files. A pile of bit code input files that you are still able to read correctly Precisely. Okay. So just to say thanks a lot, like uh, this is on the lens of code comment, this is gonna clear a lot of stuff in LibLinker. We have like insanity, like name matching rules, like extracting the dot, try to merge types there. 
Yep. And um, the other thing for the declarations, yeah, it would be really nice to just have like a single declaration. Right now it's a symmetrical functions. Do you have definitions and declarations? Global variables who have definitions and declarations, alias only ever have definitions. Right. So it's really annoying when you have a alias definition now we wanted to make a declaration. The only way to do it, you have to do a replace our users with, which does not work if you're lazy reading bit code, which is double annoying when you're trying to do that during the LTO. Yes. Which is a problem we have right now. Yeah, I, I was either talking to you or someone about that recently. Yes, one of those other quirks. I don't know whether I'll hit that particular issue with all of this, but it hopefully will make it perhaps a little easier. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I would like to ask to keep the type available for the bival parameters. What would you do with it? Uh, during lowering, we make use of it. Uh, we look at the content of the structures. I couldn't quite hear that. We look at the content of the structs during lowering to decide on, uh, yeah, how to pass certain. Uh, oh, it's part of your ABI. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Is that in tree? No. <laughs> okay. Do we have any uses in tree that do anything like that? I don't think so. That might be difficult to maintain if there's no entry need for that kind of representation. It's still an open discussion. Uh, if you keep your eye on LLVM dev mailing list, I'll probably like resurrect the thread and be good to have all of those opinions in that thread so we can at least make sure we know what we're doing. Okay. I appreciate you bringing it up. Yeah. Wait for the mic since this is all recorded, so it's helpful to have. If you're getting rid of um, information about what the point is pointing to, is there any impact on things like FD pick, where function pointers look considerably different to data pointers? Uh, or is that visible at this stage? What was the acronym you were using? Uh, function descriptor pick, where a, a pointer to a function is generally a, two, a, 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 a tuple of, of pointed to its pick data. And I'm not familiar with that particular detail, and I don't know whether LLVMIR represents such a thing. So the thing you have to understand is that the pointer type already doesn't carry enough information to preserve that if you need it. Uh, like you, you can bit cast too freely between pointer types in the IR. There's no way to preserve that information today. Uh, if you relied on it, then you get you might have been getting lucky, but you would have gotten unlucky eventually. Uh, there are analogous things. The best example I have is uh, like thread local storage and a couple of other things have genuinely different pointers. And the way they model those are with address spaces. And address spaces are an actual, like, like proper and firm part of the uh, pointer type system. And those are checked in a way that type, the pointy type isn't. Yeah, to um, talk about address spaces for a little bit more. Uh, so address spaces are an attribute on a, a pointed type. Those remain on the pointed type even after this change. We'll be pulling out the pointy type, but the address space is still firmly a property of the pointer. And you only change that through explicit separate address space casts. So they don't have the same fluidity of pointy types. Are we going to have any releases that see this intermediate? We already have. It? OK. So was it? We're going to have more. <laughs> did we just ship 3.7? Yeah. So 3.7 has the intermediate state, much of what I've been discussing here. It has IR and bit code changes for most things, uh, but they're all explicit and redundant at the moment. Uh, hopefully, we'll get to Bival before the next release. And that would be the only, that would be another intermediate state. It's unlikely, uh, maybe we'll actually get through it all and actually do the main flag flip before the next release, but I wouldn't guarantee it. So is new, new um, IR text code we're going to be writing now if we follow, if we go with the, the new uh, syntax, is that going to change when you do the flip? It will. If you look at the, the current IR syntax, I didn't actually show it in the talk, but it looks like load i32 comma i32 star value. So there's total redundancy there at the moment. At some point, that i32 star will change to, for example, PTR. So at the moment, there is like explicit textual redundancy, and that will go away eventually. So there is some churn left to do. Uh, just as a request, if it's at all possible to get the last of the textual and bit code changes necessary to have kind of the full both worlds supported uh, 
IR state in place uh, by the next release. I think that would be very helpful to people out of tree just so that they can kind of rebase their tests up to that because I think we can support the old style of pointer types for a very long time. Uh, but it, it, it would be useful if all of the new things that people need to write in their IR in order to, to support not having a pointy type were in place, uh, just, just so that people can update their front ends and other things. It's a good question. I don't know what the world would look like in, an, in a truly intermediate state where we supported both kinds of pointers. Because of the way that IR and Bitcode are read, using this essentially type hinted parsing, if we change load to produce an opaque pointer type, or uh, gap, say, to, to have a value type that is the opaque pointer type, then all of the rest of your IR has to use the opaque pointer type to parse. We could maybe do a, a, an even more weird hyper intermediate state where we let an i32 star value reference refer to an opaque pointer value definition. I, I'm talking more about the state where, where both point, like a generic pointer type and a pointer type with a pointy type both exist in LLVM and work, but we haven't switched the instructions, like right before the flag day. Okay, so uh, maybe right? I, uh, what is the value in having both of the types if we haven't changed the instructions? Uh, so, so one of the in interesting things is that having, in, in several of the cases, you've had to add type information that wasn't in the IR previously. Right. And I think it's very useful to give uh, front-end authors uh, kind of a good bit of time to add the plumbing to their front end necessary to plumb that type through, if you understand. Uh, th there, there were some places where we did not have the type necessary because we assumed that the LLVM pointer happened to have a cached value of the, the type we would need. Right. And, and front end authors are gonna have to do some amount of work in the, on their end to, to support the new IR formats. And, and my hope is to try and, before breaking their world completely, to try and, and kind of get that through, if it's possible. If it's not possible for technical reasons, that, that's understandable. No, that's, that's, so at an API level, so for what most people are writing against, if they're purely writing against LLVM APIs, they can probably almost do all the migration today. Uh, because I changed the fundamental APIs to make the parser be able to build a load without specifying a pointer type, most of those APIs do support explicitly providing a type. And as, as I was encouraging here, sure, totally get a head start on that. Not all the APIs have changed. I changed them ad hoc as I needed them. And as I find more uses, I will change more of them. Uh, but you can certainly provide patches. It's totally, like, they're just trivial wrappers uh, one way or the other. If you find instruction like uh, IR Builder and other stuff that doesn't provide a type, chances are three levels down, it splits it and does provide a type. So you just have to propagate that split up a few API levels. And you can totally do that. I know you haven't gotten to all the optimization passes yet, but do you expect performance to get worse on any particular optimization passes because uh, of typeless pointers? Uh, the compile time performance right, could right. potentially regress in the places where we are leaning on this, but everywhere we are leaning on this are essentially missed program optimization opportunities. So, so ultimate output might be better, but... The ultimate output essentially cannot get worse. If we are relying on this information, they're missed opportunities. We may be, we never come up against those missed opportunities, but they are missed. Uh, Any more questions? Thank you, David. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>